uh, just before I start, um, I strangely yesterday I saw um, a, there was a show on. I say a show, a docudrama. You know what that is like a documentary and a drama, uh, and it was about Revelation. Uh, it was on a, a Sky Sky Documentaries channel, uh, and it just reminded me just by as we go through this, just by how much people are obsessed with trying to uh, picture what it will look like. Uh, and one of them was that Christians will be treated as terrorists. I mean, possible. Um, but other things like uh, the, 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 like we said before in other parts that we studied, uh, that the scorpions or the um, uh, the things that are coming will, will represent helicopters and war and, and all this stuff. And that was all in there. And, and I, I watched it for all of 60 seconds. <laughs> and thought, this is a waste of time. We're so obsessed as people, as a, as, a, as a nation society in this whole world to focus so much on the depiction of things rather than maybe the, what, what the Bible actually says. Uh, and I just, I just wanted to give that to you because I was quite struck by it and I thought, we're just so obsessed by it. We want, we want, we want to be able to see what it looks like now. And I just want to just... Give this, give this encouragement to you. Stay with the word. Stay with what you read. If you want to watch it and those things, that's fine. I don't have anything against it in that sense, but don't get carried away with it because there's all sorts of weird stuff. It even included the jab being uh, the mark of the beast, would you believe? Uh, and, and so I think it's probably a recent thing. Um, but anyway, I give that to you as encouragement uh, and hopefully uh, you'll, uh, you, you do with it what you will. This week we're looking at Sin Exposed, Revelation 20, I've called it Sin Exposed, uh, and we're looking at the thousand year reign of Christ. He's going to reign on earth for a thousand years. Uh, it is the judgment of Satan as well, as he's allowed to come back and deceive the nations one last time, and the judgment of those who chose not to give their lives to Christ. This chapter, this chapter comes between the account of our Lord's decisive victory at Armageddon and the descent of the new Jerusalem from heaven to earth. It focuses on the beginning of Jesus, Jesus' reign on earth and the great white throne judgment when believers from all periods of history are judged and sentenced to eternal suffering in the lake of fire. There's a consistency in Revelation. It's mostly intense. Okay, so we keep reading this. There's an intenseness about Revelation. So by now, I hope you're not surprised that this is where we are uh, in Revelation, that we keep seeing this again. But this is the final judgment now, and I'll, I'll explain a bit about that. It's quite interesting. Uh, after this point in the end times, uh, evil will then have been completely defeated uh, and, and completely and entirely uh, removed uh, from the presence of God and his people. Uh, the main focus, I think, of the application from this chapter will be the purpose behind Jesus's, Jesus allowing Satan to return one last time. What's the purpose behind that? Why didn't he just get rid of him straight away? Uh, interesting question. Some people do ask it. I've read about this, and some people do say, uh, why, why not just eradicate him? Just get rid of him. He can beat him any time. We'll get into that. But I think there's two reasons behind this. Firstly, there is a demonstration of God's power over Satan, by being able to bind him and unbind him. That means to shackle him and unshackle him. Okay. Uh, and, uh, but it will be according to God's will, not Satan. So God is, is expressing, showing just how powerful he is. In, in literally a thought, if that's what God does, he can bind Satan. He can hold him captive. That's encouragement. But secondly, uh, uh, and what I believe encompasses the thousand year reign the judgment of Satan and the judgment of those who are dead to Christ is the final exposure and confirmation of the human race's demonstration of its rebellion, of its depravity towards a gracious, loving God in the form of sin. That even to this end, uh, after the thousand years, there will be people who will not want what God is offering. This chapter will make clear, in case it wasn't known, that to choose to not believe in Jesus Christ, the saviour of the world, is not something that happens to you. It's not by accident. Everyone has the chance to make a decision. 
It is not a case that we can go to God on these times and I'll talk about this judgment and what it means and we'll have a chance to give our case to him. But that in this final demonstration of what it will be like to live under the reign of Jesus, a glimpse and preview of what eternity would be like, it will show the root of sinful man and it will be exposed for what it is. A choice to go against God and yet still deny its consequences and responsibility for that choice. And that happens in every day. We, we, we probably do it ourselves. I, I've no, I think I do it. <laughs> There's something, and maybe it's subconsciously, maybe we do it on purpose, but I, I sometimes think that we, we do things, but we don't want the consequences of those choices or actions. Uh, we don't want to take responsibility for those choices or actions. So let's get into our first uh, few verses. It's Revelation 20. Uh, we're looking at verses 1 to 3. And I saw an angel uh, coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil or, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time so this is kind of these first few verses are like a summary of what we're going to see in the next verses okay so just giving us a summary of what's happening of what's going to happen in the next few verses so i'll give it a kind of a little overview of this uh, what we first see is a, a crucial and critical principle that god has power over satan himself that in no way has satan uh, an equal and I'll, I'll describe that as well but we first saw this demonstration of God's sovereignty over Satan uh, in our Revelation study. In Revelation uh, 12, verse 9, it says the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. See that same wording used again, the devil or Satan, uh, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth and his angels with him. Just again, demonstrating that God has all authority over Satan. Can't say that enough. But what we see is this angel who carries out the work and we need to be clear again that this is not jesus but another angel now in this particular case it's quite important to know that an angel uh, did the work of seizing satan and bounding him for a thousand years under god's power and authority of course but you see what it shows what it shows us is that god demonstrates that he has no rival, even in the devil himself. I think we often picture in, in films or whatever we want to do, in, in maybe not directly, symbolically, you know, we, we, I think we, we try and show that Satan is somehow equal to God, like he's his opposite number, like he has equal power. And they're kind of at this battle, and they, no one can win because they're equal beings. It's rubbish, uh, by the way. It's, it's nonsense. Uh, God has all power to put Satan away. And we'll see this in Revelation 20. Uh, he has all power. So Satan is not equal in power. He has no particular ability that outwits God or uh, confuses God or whatever. He can, do, he can do nothing that will make God be surprised. Uh, God has full control and is over Satan. So in using the angel to do it, a statement is being made by God that the devil is not equal and opposite to God. I think in how God deals with uh, Satan in this particular way also serves to demonstrate uh, Satan's weakness in comparison to God himself. What we see here is that in a, in a way God doesn't directly deal with Satan. And this is that demonstration of saying, if, if God had to deal directly with Satan here, that might be saying that he might have some equality with God. And yet he's not. What he's saying is this angel comes, he sends an angel, and the angel does the work of sending Satan down, of binding him, of chaining him. So there, there's something in this, I think, that says that um, he, he's, not, he's, he's not even a bit, a, a mark on God. He's nowhere near God. And in fact, he can just send an angel to go and do the work that God needs to be done. But then why does God only do this for a thousand years? Why does he put him away only for a thousand years? Let's first understand what the, what the thousand years represent. And we're going to go into 
um, some uh, theologies that I need to explain to you. We need to explain to them to you because otherwise they kind of won't make sense. So I'm going to go as clearly and as slowly as I can because these are quite technical concepts. But I need to explain them to you otherwise it kind of doesn't really make sense. The thousand years is called the millennium. That's expected. It's millennium, thousand years. And there are many ways that this thousand years is understood amongst scholars, uh, amongst commentators, um, people who study the word, especially when it comes to Christ's rule and reign. And what it really hangs on is the biblical fact that Jesus' second coming can only happen once. So whatever theology that we're going to look at here, Jesus can only come back once. What the debate is, is where he comes back. At what point in this timeline does he come back? Now, for some reason, Revelation is probably the only book, I think, theologically, where we're introduced to two principles. Uh, firstly, how God's people are raptured. So that's when we're taken up to heaven. And we talk about a pre-tribulation. So that's before all the terrible stuff happens. Or there's a rapture during the terrible stuff of tribulation. Or there's a rapture after the tribulation. Okay, so those are the three theories of rapture. When does it happen? When are we taken up as believers? It's basically saying when a believer is taken up to heaven. In the middle, in the beginning, in the middle, or after the seven years of tribulation. The second principle that ties into that is regarding when Christ will return in relation to the millennium or not. There's three things here. I think I've got them on the slide. Pre-millennialism, I can say this at home, I can't say it now because I'm, I'm speaking them out loud. Um, amillennialism, amillennialism and post-millennialism. We're going to go through this order that you've got on the screen, pre, post and a. So a is, just quickly, that they don't believe that there's a thousand year reign. I'll explain. It, it's not a mid, it's not like mid-tribulation, this is... They don't really believe there's a time of Jesus' reign on earth. I'll explain and go through. Okay, let's have a look at this. I'm going to try and, I've tried to write this out as simply as possible. Okay, but we need to understand these things, not because they necessarily save us, by the way, but to understand Revelation 20, it's helpful, I think. So pre, pre-millennial, um, Jesus will come back. This is the, this is the kind of what it is. Jesus will come back in a literal way, at the start of the thousand year reign and rule. Uh, there's, a, there's a classic pre-millennial and a modern pre-millennial, or there's other words. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? There's just so much stuff out there to go through. The classic version of this says that God's people are raptured after the seven years tribulation, where the modern version of this is a more symbolic rule of Jesus's, of Jesus's reign and says that we're raptured before, also before the seven year, sorry, before the seven year tribulation. And the work of God in sharing the gospel on earth is actually done by the nation of Israel. Confused? And this is where Jews will preach the gospel. They will become uh, Messianic Jews and they will preach the gospel. So that's pre-millennial in a very short description. It, it, if I was to go through, we would be here for hours. Uh, Post-millennialism. Uh, this states that Jesus comes back after the millennium, probably easy to understand. So after we're talking about the, the millennium now, the thousand year reign, this theory says that Jesus comes back after that. Okay. It believes that we are currently living in the millennium now. I know it's just amazingly confusing, isn't it? Uh, and that during this uh, long period of time, Christians like us, us Christians are tasked to extend the kingdom of God through the gospel and share the gospel throughout the world. It is a, um, as many people say, it's an overtly positive view of, the, of, of what's going on, that we're currently, the theory that we're currently living in the thousand year reign, or the symbolic thousand year reign, as it were. It pro promotes a progressive uh, improvement in the age of the church, filling the earth and being ready for the return of Jesus after the age so it's a post-rapture tribulation view as in we are taken up to heaven after tribulation okay a millennialism in case you're not confused already 
This understands Christ's return to occur after the millennium, but different to post-millennium, in that they see the millennial reign happening in heaven as a spiritual reign in heaven and not on earth. This also states that we are currently living in the thousand-year reign today as well. A millennialism, millennialism states that the millennium is a heavily ruled, heavenly ruled, inaugurated at the death and resurrection of Christ and concluding at his return. Again, basically what it believes, we're currently living in that time, but there's no thousand year reign on earth. It's all heavenly. It's all happening in the heavens. So that's what this theory uh, believes. The thousand year reign span given in Revelation 20 verses 1 to 10, it says it's not a literal thousand years. It's rather symbolic, a long period of time, basically. It represents the entire church age from the cross to the second coming. Again, a post rapture view, as in we are taken up after this period ends. Okay, why, why tell you all that? What's the benefit of knowing all that stuff and trying to fit it in your already cluttered brains, especially around Christmas? What is the benefit of putting this into your heads? Now, listen, I'm all up for thinking through the literal and non-literal aspects of Revelation and exploring how these might play out, which I encourage you to explore, I encourage the whole church to explore, uh, but essentially as theories. I'm not one who will hold my anchor to theories, even theologies created by man. We need to be really careful. The reason I say that is there must be a line drawn about what, around what is we're, we are exploring but what could also be dangerously dividing Christians into opposing groups. When I describe to you these theologies, what I called them always ended in ism. What many people use at the end of these words is ist. You are a pre-millennialist. You are a post-millennialist. You are a millennialist. Guess what that's doing? It's got nothing to do with the Bible, and it's all about dividing us in the Word. It's all about taking us away from and focusing on theories. We need to be really clear that we need to be really careful in when we look at these things. We must be sure. Let me let me just see where I am here because I want to get this right. In any theological ideas that we develop by drawing them from biblical facts using the word that try to give us an idea of how something might look or be defined we must make sure that theological ideas do not in themselves become idols i'm seeing a worrying growth in theological ideas becoming more about biblical truth than the bible itself and we need to be really careful that man's ideas are not going above the station of God, not above the station of the word. Now, we need not be uh, ignorant to these things. We should, we, should, we should look at them and see if they're helpful in explaining the Bible. But we need to make sure they don't become an idol, uh, which we are known by or be, by which our faith is built on. Uh, a... One, just an example of this, uh, you could probably take it to any example. If you took it to the realm of, of churches and said, uh, I, I am strictly a Baptist. That's me. I'm strictly a Methodist. I'm strictly a this and a that. The problem becomes is that the principles of those things become the thing that we operate on in our faith. And those are risky things to do. All we really should be doing when we call ourselves, maybe, not even, I don't necessarily agree with that, that we call ourselves these things, but if we like the principles of them, we're merely operating on the basis that they have been drawn from the Bible. Okay? So where they don't, and sometimes you might question some of those principles, then they're not things we follow. They're not things we, we necessarily have to hold to because it's got to be about the word. We have to come back and say, but what does the word say? We don't want to build on man's ideas. Calvinism has become a massive thing in the last few years. It's an agreements and disagreements with Calvinism. You need to look that up. I don't have time to tell you what Calvinism is. Uh, but be careful 
it doesn't become your, 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 your base of your faith. Because I can see people already being divided by these things. And we just need to be really careful. So the reason why I'm explaining this all is because of that. There's so much tied up in this of, of, of many good men and women who are looking at and studying these words and these chapters and saying, it might happen like this, it might be like this, but what does the word say? Is it helpful for us to understand the word or is it taking us away and distracting us from the word itself? So, hopefully, in understanding what the millennium is, why has God bound Satan for only a thousand years? Oh, I think what I believe God wants us to see is a glimpse of what the kingdom is like by giving us a taste of it on earth. In that for either a literal or a set period of time, Christ will come back and reign on earth, bringing a perfect time of peace. However, it should be said that it isn't the reign of the Messiah of himself that will change the heart of man. If you really care, there's a fine line here. People on earth, and this is just a view, just looking at this, will still need to trust Jesus. They will still need to trust him. It's not, it's still not saying it's automatic because Jesus is reigning, okay? Because what we're going to see is that the devil's going to come back. And what we're going to see is that repetitive nature within us to rebel. So from that, we, we know that we have to still purposefully choose and trust in Jesus Christ. During the millennium, uh, it says, some people say Israel will be the superpower of the world. The citizens, the people of earth will acknowledge and submit to the lordship of Jesus uh, here, uh, but will, there will be no war. So there'll be peace on earth, reigning peace on earth. And that's actually, I'll go for a few verses here. Uh, from Isaiah and from a couple of others, just to show you what, this is a glimpse of what it might be like. So again, we're not going, I'm not drawing a picture out of nothing. I'm using scripture. Say, so what does it look like? What might that time look like? This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw coming, uh, sorry, concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established uh, as the highest, uh, uh, the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and of and all nations will stream to it many people will come and say come let us go up to the mountain of the lord to the temple of god of jacob he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths the law will go out from zion the word of the lord from jerusalem he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war anymore. Come, the sentence of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Just giving you a picture. We're using scripture to try and find what might this time be like. We also find that the way animals will relate to each other and to humans will be transformed. It is in Isaiah 11, 6 to 9, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the uh, yearling together, yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Uh, their young will lie down together and the lion and will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In Hosea 3 verse 5, King David, it says, will have a prominent place. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord to his blessings in the last days. Just giving you a sense of this devotion to God, that it will be absolute uh, everything given to him. It will be a time of purity and devotion to God. Zechariah 13 I'll read this out. It's one, to, it's one tonight, but it's only nine verses. It says, On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. On that day, I will banish the names of idols from the land and they will be remembered no more, declares the Lord Almighty. I will remove both the prophets and the spirit of impurity from the land. And if anyone still prophesies, 
their father and mother to whom they were born will say to them, you must die because you have told lies in the Lord's name. We told, spoke at prophecies last week, didn't we? Brief warning I gave last week. Be very careful. Be very careful. If it's not in the word, it needs to be tested, especially so. It always needs to be tested. But when someone is making a claim that is not in the Bible, it is most likely false. Then their own parents will stab the one who prophesies. On that day, every prophet will be ashamed of their prophetic vision. They will not put on a prophet's garment of hair in order to deceive. Each will say, I'm not a prophet, I'm a farmer. That land has been my livelihood since my youth. If someone asks, what are these wounds on your body? They will answer, the wounds I was given at the house of my friends. Awake, sword against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered and I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two thirds will be struck down and perish. Remember the, the thirds that we learned about early in Revelation, yet one third will be left in it. This third I will put in the fire. We learned that also, didn't we? We saw that about, the, about people being put in the fire, in the wine press, and then burn. We'll see that in Revelation 20, people being in the lake of fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name. And I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is our God. There's a testing of Christians through the fire. And then there's a there's a judgment of non-Christians of people who don't believe in the fire. They will be put in the fire, the lake of fire. I'll get onto that as well. There will be a real rebuilt temple and restored temple service. Amos 9 verse 11. In that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be. Saints in their resurrected state will be given the responsibility in the time of the millennium with Jesus. People who have given their life to Jesus, who have been uh, killed because they stayed with Jesus, will now be given roles within this kingdom. Uh, that's in 1 Corinthians 6. Verses two to three, or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life starts to help us understand why God calls us judges. It's not that we're God the judge, that we are God judging people, but we have a role in this millennial kingdom to be serving Jesus. I've got loads of quotes today, guys. Loads of quotes. A couple of Spurgeons, but some others. First Spurgeon one. He sums it up like this. Let us rejoice that scripture is so clear and so explicit upon this great doctrine of the future triumph of Christ over the whole world. We believe that the Jews will be converted and that they will be restored to their own land. We believe that Jerusalem will be the central metropolis of Christ's kingdom. We also believe that all the nations shall walk in the light of the glorious city, which shall be built at Jerusalem. We expect that the glory which shall have its centre there shall spread over the whole world, covering it as if, uh, as with a sea of holiness, happiness and delight. For this, we look with joyful expectation. Always trust Spurgeon to sum up what you're trying to say. Just look forward to the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ, because it's going to be amazing. Let's move on. Revelation 20, 4 to 6. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image. So these are the people that stayed with Jesus all the way through and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and, and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Back to our... Uh, verses in Corinthians, links back, we're going to reign with Christ. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. The first resurrection, what's that? It is given to those who died, with, died in Jesus' name. The second death, death, are for those who do not have part in the first resurrection. And they are not blessed. 
They are under the power of the second death. These are people who do not believe in Jesus and they are without privilege. John 5, this is helpful. John 5 uh, verses 28 to 29. Do not be amazed at this. For time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. And those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. First, uh, first resurrection, this is what describing, second death. People will be risen who were with Jesus, who, who stayed with him. They will be risen to life. Those who were not will be condemned. Those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Now, I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is in talking about um, the judgment of Satan and the judgment of death, I'm going to do that in a slightly different order because we're talking about most of the judgment of death here. So I'm just going to jump ahead a few verses. You, if you're reading your Bibles, it's divided up helpfully in sections. We're going to talk about the judgment of death and go back to the judgment of Satan. It doesn't actually matter which order we do it in here. Okay. So we're going to go with these verses here and talk about the judgment of the dead. Because it fits here what Jesus speaks of, uh, what, jo what it says in John when he mentions the second death uh, in these verses. So it says in verse um, 11, which is now not running. Okay. <laughs> Revelation 20, 11 to 14. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Uh, the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. I've done 14, should have gone to 15, but it doesn't matter. Um, firstly, seated on the throne is Jesus. This is the moment where Jesus is seated on the throne, where we see him on the throne. We know this because the presence is on the throne has an effect of making it impossible, as the verses say, for people to hide. So when it says everyone was, was scattered, I think it says, let me go back. Um, the, heavens, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. Um, there was no place to hide, is basically what the verses are saying. Jesus is on his throne. No matter where you went, there was no place to hide from judgment. There is no place to hide from judgment. But here also in John, John 5, 22 to 27, it says the same. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. We also know that Jesus will judge. That all may honour the son just as they honour the father. Whoever does not honour the son does not honour the father who sent him very truly i tell you whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me as eternal life and will not be judged interesting we always say christians we're going to be judged right i'll explain that as well as eternal life will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life very truly i tell you a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the son of god and those who hear will live for as the father has life in himself so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. Basically saying Jesus is God and he's given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. So he's going to judge. He's sitting on the throne. We've got the picture. Jesus is right there. No one can hide from his presence. No one. The throne of judgment is a place where those who have not given their life to Jesus will be judged. And we should be clear. This isn't a trial. This is it. This is the moment. This is the, there's no more chances. This is it. No person who stands in front of this judgment throne will get to put their case to God or provide mitigating circumstances or, or, or give some sort of case. Oh, but I didn't know. That's, this is not a trial. This is sentencing. We look at it in a court system. This is just sentencing. There is no chance to be redeemed. One commentator puts it like this and says, many people think they will have this chance to tell God a thing or two at the final judgment when they face him. I've heard this as well. Have you heard this? People say, oh, they don't necessarily believe in God, but they say, oh, if I face him, 
oh, I tell him a thing or two about my life, what I didn't like, what he's done. It's kind of belittling what is waiting, awaiting those who don't believe. But this is a sentencing. The trial is now. The trial was during our lives. When our actions toward God were all recorded in the books, there's no need for God to give us some platform to make some appeal or to hear from us because the books will represent the work that we will be judged by. So what's written in the books, not the book of life, the book of life is for those who are in Christ. The books is endless writing about what we, what those who don't believe in Jesus have done. And so when we say, when God reads this out almost, we can't go, oh no, but you see, when I did that, there won't be any of that. It'll be so detailed, so descriptive of what we've done and absolutely 100% precise that it will just be about sentencing. If people are not listed in the book of life, then each one is judged according to his works because they've relied on works. Does it make sense? This is why we say, as Christians, it's not about works. For those who rely on their works to be good people, they will be judged by their own works. This is an amazingly fair system. This is brilliant, isn't it, that God's come up with. and says, well, if you want to be judged by that, you will be judged by that. So there is no reprieve here because people have chosen to give their works as a way of saying, well, this is right, isn't it? This is good enough. Sadly, it won't be. Those who refuse to come to God by faith will, by default, be judged and condemned by their works. Uh, I think it, it's, uh, it's Mounts or Monts, I think his name is. He says here, the issue is not salvation by works, but works as the irrefutable evidence of a man's actual relationship with God. Do your works reflect your relationship with God. That, that's all they've got to do. That, that, that's, that's it. They haven't got to be impressive. They haven't got to be great in the sight of other people. But what you're driven by in your works, do they reflect your relationship with him? Actually, it's also helpful that if they don't reflect a good relationship with God, it can also be helpful for us to know, actually, maybe I need to write some things that don't sit well in our relationship. The sea we saw uh, in these verses uh, represents a place of unburied bodies. Everyone will be given a body by which they will then face judgment of the throne. So we saw that in the other verses, uh, people risen to life, those who are in Jesus, and those who will be risen to life, those who will be judged, who will be condemned and sentenced. Everyone will have bodies. What we might understand is that for those that believe this is not the throne we will face, in case you thought, this isn't confusing at all. But this necessarily isn't the throne that Christians will face. For those in Christ Jesus, we're spared this particular throne of judgment because our sins were already judged at the cross. It says that in the verses, doesn't it? We will not be judged. However, however, Christians will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ which is kind of different, but kind of, it's all, it's all about God's judgment, okay? It's all about God's reign on his throne. This is where it says it, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So then, when we pass from these bodies to the world beyond, we must each give an account according to what we have done whether good or bad. And this describes a judgment of works of believers. So our motives are different to unbelievers. Does that make sense? Our, our motives are different in the works that we do. We do it for Jesus' rule and reign, for his glory, for his kingdom, to see people change and to see people accept the, uh, the gospel. Other people do it because their works, unbelievers, non-believers will do it because they value their own works. There's a big difference. Helpfully, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 to 15. If anyone builds on this foundation uh, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, 
their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. The reason why we got out of it? Jesus. Always comes back to Jesus. Not your works, not the things you've done. Always faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We won't be punished for what was not done rightly to the Lord. It will simply be burned up. And it will be as if we never did those things because that's forgiveness on the cross. We are forgiven. So guess what? God carries that promise all the way to the end. And he says, you know, when I said, if you trust in Jesus, you'll be forgiven. I'm doing it right now. Forgiving you. Because Jesus is right. Jesus' judgment is right. We will simply be rewarded for what remains. We don't escape God's judgment. We satisfy in Jesus. Does that make sense? It is satisfied in Jesus Christ. So those verses show it's amazing how revelation can really help to give much more context to these other verses that we probably read quite often. And now what we're seeing, hopefully, is just this helpful description of what, what do those verses really mean? Well, actually, it's all about Jesus. Not that Jesus just says, well, your works are rubbish. Actually, they are. <laughs> actually, what we offer is nonsense, is, is not, is, is I said in the, in the right way, and, sorry, not in the right way, in the nicer way, it's rubbish. There's a horrible word which the Bible uses to describe those works, if it's all about works. But because Jesus, because we trust in him who forgave our sins, who covers us in righteousness, it is because of him that we are satisfied God. Romans 3, uh, verses 23 to 24, says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. When a thousand... Oh, well, there was another verse there, sorry. Uh, yes. Anyway. I need to go back because I'm going way too far. Yeah, let me read that again. There is another verse. There's, there's, okay, there's one screen. For all have sinned, will short the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Uh, wow, my eyesight's getting bad. Okay. So let's have a look uh, at how the unbinding of Satan for a short time reinforces this principle that as long as we believe in Jesus, the one who was sent, can we be saved from the lake of fire? Uh, Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10. So we're going back now. This is about Satan. We're going to look at Satan. Uh, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison. And we'll go out to see the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. Basically means there's going to be loads of them. Loads. There's going to be millions. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil, who deceived them, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. For the thousand years of the direct reign of Jesus over this earth, Satan was bound and inactive. But after the thousand years are over, he will be released and successfully organize many people in another rebellion against him, against God. God will allow this to happen because what it will reveal, reveal and this, this is at the, the most, I would say the most obvious point that God's making it so clear now just how depraved we are. This really is the point that God will show the depravity of man versus the graciousness of God. When Jesus gives us this thousand year of rule, it is a glimpse of heaven. It is a glimpse of what is to come. And if we can live in that for a thousand years, and yet people will still at some point, rebel, not want to bow the knee, not want to give their life to Jesus. 
I think this for me reveals just how depraved we can be. Why we need Jesus. We are capable of even going through a thousand years and at the end of it still going, I don't want it. For all of human history, man has wanted to blame his sinful condition on his environment. Mankind. With the millennial kingdom of Jesus, God will give mankind a thousand years of a perfect environment with no Satan, no crime, no violence, no evil. But after that time, man will once again feed his fallen nature, sinful self, and yet again think that we can be gods. What it will show after all the warnings and everything that Jesus warned us about during his ministry on earth will be utterly true. That the problem is in us, not in God. Everything in the world wants to blame God for everything, doesn't it? Every single person for every single event. And yet we abuse that by doing other things that we don't even question. To choose to not believe in Jesus Christ, the saviour of the world, is not something that happens to us. I remember someone saying, I don't know where I heard this, there's a quote. Uh, and it's, it's sort of a paraphrase, it's sort of the right way to say it. Um, if you don't see the problem, then you are the problem. This is what sin is, isn't it? If I don't see the problem, there can't be one. Actually, no, no, it's because you are the problem. And that, that's incredibly sad. We don't, we, we don't recognise the sin in ourselves to be the problem. We think it's everyone else. Hey, look, we even do it as Christians, right? We, do it, we still do it because we're in, in a fallen time, in a fallen world, and we're not perfect. Uh, host, I think it's host, it must be host. It says he, it will be proved once more that man, whatever his advantages in the environment, apart from the grace of God and new birth, remains at heart only evil and that enmity with God. That's what it, it will reveal. Without the grace of God, it will be, it will be absolute evil. The grace of God right now limits the effects of evil in this place and this in this world when god removes that grace as we've seen in revelation evil will be its uttermost a hundred percent it will be it'll be nothing like you've ever seen for this reason and for the unrepentant heart this is what remains the forever and ever of the torment that awaits those who will not bow the knee to Jesus is just that. It will be forever. Wolverd, a quote, says here, says there would be no way possible in the Greek language to state more emphatically the everlasting punishment of the lost. And here in mentioning both day and night and the expression forever and ever, literally to the ages of ages. So, so we know what unbelievers need to do. Just like us, before we became Christians, we need to repent and believe. But what does the church need to do? What warning does it need to heed in the light of this final judgment? We need to be able to talk about sin. It needs to be talked about in our churches and from the pulpit. We cannot hide from the fact that on the day we are judged, the very thing that will condemn us will be the very thing that Jesus warned us about and died for, sin. Paul said clearly, Romans 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, I'm not an advocate for an unbalanced fire and brimstone type of preaching, but we just read about the final judgment of God. I worry that the church has become like the world, and I mean the church as all of us, the whole church. Everyone can suffer, every church can suffer from this. I worry that we've become like the world in avoiding talking about the S word, sin. So what do we do instead? When we don't want to talk about sin, we talk about a Jesus who just wants you to be happy. 
Spurgeon uh, said this. He said, it does not spoil your happiness to confess your sin. The unhappiness is in not making the confession. One of the smaller churches in the letters to the churches in Revelation was the one that was commended for its continued faith in Jesus. Not because it was small in number, but because they focused on Jesus and preached the word. They edified one another in the faith and told people about the reality of what it means to change your life from one that goes against God to the one that turns around and honours him instead. Let me say this, when we talk about sin openly and in line with the word of God, here is what it is meant to do. When sin is talked about and people accept the reality of sin in their lives, in line with the promise of God, we are firstly let loose from the chains of sin. And then because God promised it, when we accept that we need Jesus to fix us up and make us new, guess what he does? Promise made, promise delivered. This chapter, above all, I think should reveal to us the desperate situation many might find themselves in when facing sentencing in judgment. No matter how many people want to put it off or shirk from it, on that day, as the Bible says, there will be no place to hide. What they should do is <clears throat> spur us on to be confident that the church that represents Jesus Christ should be one that is different from the world. That difference is what will bring people to Christ. I'll end on, on this verse, or these verses, 1 John 1, verses 5 to 10. I think this sums up exactly how we need to, be, uh, to deal with sin and talk about it. 1 John 1, 5 to 10. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. I think that really brings our message to a close perfectly and rightly today. Let us pray now together.